I hope you can all hear me and see me next night. Uh, I was supposed to be there in person, but I had a lot of travel adventures yesterday, so I couldn't make it. Um, so that was it. Giving it virtually. Okay, so the um, title itself is Structured in New Sequence, and it seems a bit controversial, but I think you'll see by the end that I don't really mean what uh, it seems like I mean. Um, so, everything is working, right? Okay, so I'm going to assume that things are working. Um, the reason that I can even make such a bold claim is mostly because of alcohol and things like this, is that now we have. Um, the number of structures is almost similar now to the order of magnitude of number of sequences. And since structure is in some sense one step closer to function, we can um, learn a lot more theoretically from having the structure uh, in addition to having the sequence about present function. Um, but what I really want to talk about is not exactly that, but about uh, from a mathematics or computational biology perspective, uh, about the algorithms involved. Because we have a lot of algorithms for protein sequences. We've had them for a decade, they've been, uh, we have some new ones uh, over the past years. We've, they've been highly optimized, they've gone through a lot of improvement, and I think a lot of people in the field uh, are really familiar with sequence algorithms. And so I really want to talk about how that is now translating to to the structures or the, the huge influx of structures that we now have. Um, and so for this, I want to talk about three different classes, let's say, of methods. Um, Kamer counting, which is when you fragment your protein sequence into overlapping Kamers and then see what kind of Kamers are available. This is a basis of a lot of different um, algorithms that build on top of this. Um, and then alignment, so you can have pairwise alignment. Multiple, of, uh, multiple sequence alignment, and then this is of course the basis for things like phylogenetic trees and so on. Uh, and finally, prediction or machine learning, which is quite vague, of course, but it, it covers this idea of having your sequences, extracting um, features from them, or creating a model that extracts features from them, and then uh, using that to make some insights on either the data that you're already training on, which is unsupervised, or some new data. Um, and so for all these three, I want to give some examples of how um, structures are now being used in similar situations. Um, I'll talk about stuff that I've been working on, but also about uh, what other people have been doing in these areas. Um, so starting with uh, k something or k -marization. So this um, works really well for sequences, of course, because there are 20 discrete amino acids or or whatever, and you can really easily split uh, your sequence and then count the number of times different subsequences appear. How would you do something like this for structures? Um, so, first of all, you can fragment your protein structure in a similar way. You could look at overlapping uh, coordinates in the backbone, or you could look at overlapping radii that um, have some atoms within, within them. Uh, but of course, these are all in three-dimensional space, so they're rotated and translated, so you can't really say this one is equal to this one like you could with a minus. Um, and so for this, um, I looked into rotation invariant moments. So this is a concept from the field of computer vision, where they use it for things like characters, recognition, and pose recognition, and so on. Essentially, it's a mathematical formula that you feed in a set of coordinates, uh, over here, uh, through this formula, and it gives you a number. Uh, but if you rotate these coordinates and feed it through the same formula, you get the same number. Um, and so here's an example with uh, just this bunny, it has a lot of points, and you can rotate it in many different ways, but you'll see that these are four moment invariant formulas, they all have exactly the same value for all of these different rotations. Um, and so what would be interesting, of course, is to use this in a search sort of situation or in a way of actually describing uh, fragments. So here I have an example of these two ears from the bunny, which you would expect, of course, to be similar, uh, rotated and translated in different ways. And then those same four moments for those two ears in uh, blue and in orange, 
and then for the random parts of the rest of the body of the same size. And you can see that the ears are kind of closer to each other, meaning that not only do these moments invariant formula give you the same number when you rotate the coordinate, but you can use them to some, somehow describe uh, different shapes. And so this is the this is the concept that I used for bringing categorization to the structure world, and it's what we call shapers. Um, and essentially, each shaper represents uh, the alpha coordinates of 16 residues in the backbone and 10 extrons around. So not just the uh, backbone, but also interactions with uh, neighboring chains. Um, and so I have now 1,024 of these. Uh, just to give you an idea of what they look like. Um, also, this is the first time a new idea to fragment proteins into uh, protein structures into shapes. I think what's sort of, uh, let's say, new here or not so common here is that it's not just the backbone anymore, but also what comes around it. And then it becomes really important. So, here, let me just explain what this shows. So, this is a representation of a shaper on the, on the left. And then on the right are some examples of proteins, which are mostly made up of the shape marks, so repeat proteins, which uh, just to show you how it looks like when it stacks up. Um, and you can see that because we have this um, radius information along with the backbone information, you can now distinguish something like this, which is also very difficult, but in a very different way from something like this. Um, so it captures both short and long range information. Um, and so that's what I call, we call geometricus, and this is what we're now using for doing a lot of things that people do with sequence gamers uh, on sequences, now with structures. Um, okay, so that, that was about gamers. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is about alignment, um, which of course forms the basis for a huge number of sequence algorithms. Um, and I think many of you may have heard already of Pulsi. So this is structure alignment, uh, structure pairwise alignment, and this actually does make use of a lot of sequence-based approaches, right? So Pulsi converts structures into a sort of sequence, uh, where instead of online masses, you have 20 characters representing some kind of 3D space. Um, and then uses Techniques in MM6, which uses K-mers, K-mer matching, and then sequence alignment to then perform structure alignment. So another example where we're now reusing the algorithms that we've somewhat honed uh, for sequences to uh, structures. And so this is for pairwise alignment, and I think this is great because it's very fast, it's as, almost as fast as, as sequence-based methods, but use structures. Um, and then we want to do the same thing for multiple structure alignment. And so, in a lot of, there are existing, of course, multiple structure alignment tools. Um, these are not optimized like sequence alignment tools, usually. And um, they tend to have this problem of creating very gappy sort of alignments. So, we wanted to address both of these things. So, first of all, the main uh, time consuming step. Um, in multiple structure alignment is deciding which two pairs or which pair of proteins to align at each step. Because you start with your whole set of proteins, you choose a pair to align, and you align them, and then you start adding to that alignment. And so choosing that usually requires all versus all alignment, which takes a lot of time. So we've now replaced that with all versus all shaper counting, which is what is done in a lot of sequ multiple sequence alignment methods like cluster and so on. Um, and we also added some, um, let's say, feedback loop in, in the alignment process so that regions which are well aligned, you don't have too many gaps there. And that is really good for if you want to use uh, your alignment as an input for machine learning tasks, because then if you have a situation, for instance, like this, where um, you have maybe two distinct um, clusters of structural uh, of structure in certain regions, you would still want to compare the features in between these. Um, yeah, so this is what we call Coretta. It's quite fast. Uh, still, of course, can be improved. I mean, I think multiple sequence aligners can be much faster than this. 
uh, but there are a lot of tricks still left in the sequence alignment field that can be adapted to structure. Okay, and then I'll spend most of the time talking about this very vague uh, concept of machine learning um, because, yeah, there is a lot to be said here. Um, and so, as I said, in, when you have protein sequences, what you would normally do is you have your set of sequences, you find a way to extract some representation from them. It could be actual features, like physical chemical properties and so on, or it could be that you uh, put them a language model and then you get a different kind of representation and so on. And then you will use that either for just similarity maybe or for dimensionality reduction, you could use it for clustering, or you could use it for making prediction of function or mutation effects and so on. Um, and now now you can finally to some sense do something similar with structure at the same scale. Um, and we're seeing a lot of this happening now with a lot of recent papers. Um, and so it's the same basic idea. You have your set of structure, you would extract maybe features or use another uh, black box techniques to uh, obtain your representation and then train your model to uh, perform the task measure. And of course, what's really interesting in machine learning is then to map back the insights that you find to the structure itself maybe in terms of these residues are predicted for a certain thing, or these regions are responsible for this, and so on. Uh, and here I'm going to make this distinction uh, between protein family and protein universe, um, because when you are working on a task in a, inside a particular protein family, let's say you want to predict kinase activation, or, some, or something like this, or linking specificity in a certain enzyme class, um, then you will be using quite different techniques than if you're looking at clustering the entire protein universe. First of all, in the protein family case, you're much more likely to use multiple sequence alignment or alignment-based techniques because there the residue correspondence between different proteins uh, is meaningful because they represent quite similar structures with some uh, variation. Whereas in the protein universe case, you would use things like shapers or uh, something that's much more broad because you can't have this meaningful residue correspondence across all the proteins in, in the protein universe. Um, and similarly, the kinds of, uh, let's say, subunits that you use in machine learning changes as well. Like you could use the entire structure or you could be looking at a residue-based level, especially for things like mutant prediction, you would probably look at features of a single residue or features of a single residue along with its local environment. Um, okay, so that's, uh, let's say, the general idea, and now I'm going to talk about some specific examples. I'll start with stuff that I did uh, in my PhD in the Netherlands, and here I was looking at um, a class of enzymes called terpenes and bases. And you don't really need to know so much about them, it's just that these are plant enzymes that make um, essentially all of the gradients of the plant, so the smell of orange, the smell of mint, etc. And what was interesting about them is that um, they, their sequence varies a lot, so they can have as low as 20 to 30 percent sequence identity and make exactly the same product, or they could have as high as like 99 percent sequence identity for a mutation and make completely different products. So this was really an area where structure-based approaches were almost uh, necessary, you would say. Um, and so for this, I could use quite a classic uh, machine learning approach where I, at that point it was modulating and not topical, but then you extract different kinds of features from the structure and then train a machine learning model to predict uh, what kinds of products are being made. And then you can inspect that model to then say which residues could be involved in the, in, in the creation of certain products. And this was quite successful. We had some uh, nice results and we were able to look at some really interesting residues. Um, and then I'm now following up on that to, to extend this to all of the 300 or so products. And this is where you then need also features from the from living perspective. There are a lot of papers on this as well coming out now where you have 
structural features from the protein and then a structure or uh, 2D features from, from your ligand, and then you predict whether those two uh, are compatible, let's say, if they bind or not. And then you can uh, use a lot more, uh, so yeah, you can use interpretation methods to then pinpoint residues that may be involved in the creation of individual products. Okay. Um, then I want to talk about some recent work that I've been doing uh, with Joanna in, um, in our group in Basel. And what Joanna is trying to do is really map the darkness or the unannotated protein universe. So uh, if you look across the protein universe, you have annotations from Swiss prod, from Interpro, people have done a lot of experiments and so on. So you have proteins which are really well described and you know what they do. With proteins where you may know what they do and so on, and then you have proteins which are similar to the ones where you know what they do, so you also kind of know what they do. Uh, but then there are proteins which are dark, where nobody really knows what they do, there haven't been experiments done, and um, these are of course really interesting because you know what do they do. Um, so what she's done is essentially map across um, Uniprox, Uniprox, and Uniret all the interpro uh, annotations. Um, and then if you look at Unira 50, which clusters um, protein sequences at the level of 50% sequence identity, you can estimate how much you know about each Unira 50 cluster. And then the assumption, of course, is that if you know something about something within the Unira 50 cluster, you probably know about the rest of its members as well. Um, and so that way you get um, let's say, the dark university you know, clusters. And then what she did was to link these all together, all the university you know, representatives, um, just based on sequence uh, identity. So we did the huge MMC search, uh, all 25 million or so against all um, MMCs, with 50% coverage as well, so that you know that it's um, at least covering half of the sequence. And then here she moved for, she mapped the darkness into this huge network and then tried to see are there really dark, um, let's say, clusters in here that we don't know anything about. And so in some cases, of course, it's that even though it's dark, it's connected to uh, proteins where we do have a lot of information, so it's not, but we could theoretically annotate these kinds of sequences. Um, and then there are the ones which are disputative, which uh, we do have information about, but then it's not at the level that Unicron will say, okay, for that um, But then there are quite a few actually clusters where we really have no idea. And this is something that uh, Joanna is quite used to doing with these large scale, uh, with these, uh, let's say, targeted evolutionary analysis. And so I just want to show you an example of how she went through this now with these structures available. So we have this cluster and we want to find out what it does. Um, and so what she usually does is, uh, of course, uh, a search. So the reciprocal activity search to find homologs and parallels. Um, and then with this from sequence, from this she found that you know it's present in a lot of bacteria. Um, and now here is where something new comes in, is uh, this new tool called LeapFry, which is a structure-based protein function predictor. And essentially it uses a Langer model and from the sequence and then the structure to, at a residue, uh, from, at a residue level, predict uh, different kinds of filters. So, for instance, here you can say that this area is predicted to be calcium. And so now she runs this as well on these dark proteins that she's trying to find, and then it predicts um, DNA binding in some regions and hydrolase activity in some other regions. Um, and then now we go back to sequence because this is the next step that she usually does is look at the genomic context so to see what's next to it um, in the upper arm. And then this the one that's next to it also turned out to be dark and unannotated. But again, we now have the structure uh, of this as well. And so you can do the same kind of prediction there. And then you, you have much more of a hypothesis um, 
than you could have probably before. So this is just a really, I thought, a nice example of how structuring is kind of changing going routine analysis that we've both been doing. Um, okay, so then that was, let's say, protein family perspective. Now what can we say about protein universe um, from a structure point of view? So can we learn more about proteins by looking across the entire optical database? Um, and how does it differ from the PDE? Like, what are we, uh, like, what have we gained in compared to the PDE, or what does the PDE have more than a for some reason? And does it create structures which are completely different from what we've seen before? Um, and so, to do this analysis, I focused only on the high confidence uh, optical structures, so more than 90 average field and high confidence regions as well, so I did not look at shapers from these uh, looping regions, which would also not make sense from a shaper point of view, so they're not really structured. Um, but of course, those parts could be quite important as well, as we uh, heard from the previous talk, so that's just a disclaimer that we look at only the structured regions for these analyses. Um, and then I uh, applied a bunch of natural language processing. So, shapers are similar to k-mers, as we saw before, but they're also similar to words in a document. So, now you can use uh, these algorithms that were made for uh, natural language uh, on protein structures. So, two kinds of things. First is topic modeling, which, um, if you think of it from a uh, document point of view, is if you have a set of articles, you want to find out what kind of topics these articles are talking about. And you do that in a completely unsupervised way. So you look for combinations of words that appear together uh, more often. And so if you do the same thing for with protein structures, essentially you come up with combinations of shapers that appear more often uh, together across different proteins. Uh, and then from these topics, I want to see how uh, is it different uh, in the optical PD compared to the PD. And so yeah, that's, I think this is what I'm aiming for, is that the PDB gives a skewed view of natural proteins. And this we sort of knew, know somehow to be true because, of course, um, people crystallize things that they are interested in studying, uh, some things are not so easy to crystallize, and so there is some bias in terms of what kinds of uh, structures are present in the PDB. Um, and then uh, the second step is outlier detection. So here I essentially make an embedding for the whole protein and then see if uh, optical proteins are, let's say, outlier, structural outliers compared to PDB proteins. And here by outlier, I just mean that they have an unusual combination of shapers. Um, okay, so let's look at the topics first. Um, this is some initial results from this. So first off, Let's talk about what alcohol has more than. So, of course, since alcohol has 200 million structures, everything is more than the PDB. So, that's not really the question here. It's like proportionally, if we took the PDB distribution of proteins as, uh, let's say, natural and extended that to uh, what we would expect to find in alcohol, we find similar sort of distributions. Um, and if we don't, then which ones do we find more in alcohol and which ones do we find more? Uh, and so, what I found is that alpha has way more of these alpha beta barrel kind of enzymes. Um, also, I think this is quite known is that it has a lot more transmembrane proteins. Transmembrane proteins were not so easy to crystallize, and alpha has a lot of really big ones as well. Um, and it has more um, repeats of, like, uh, for instance, plant pentachyphocapteide proteins do have crystal structures of some parts of it, but then the alcohol we have much longer repeats of that. Um, and then from the PDB perspective, it has more antibodies. I think this is also sort of expected because you know we have crystallized antibodies from a lot of different studies and a lot of different conditions and so on, um, often on the same sequence. Uh, and now this is actually, uh, let's say, a side effect of the technique. Um, the PDB is seen as having more disordered loops because, of course, we remove disordered loops in the optical structures. Um, 
yeah, so these are the kinds of, uh, let's say, things that we could maybe learn on a larger scale. For instance, another thing that I found is that the PDB has uh, more representatives of ribosomal proteins. Um, and this could be, I'm not sure, I have to check this out, but it could be because ribosomal proteins generally form huge complexes. Um, and maybe on the whole, is not able to reproduce the exact same number that's found in these huge complexes. Um, okay, and then if we look at the outliers and cross that with the darkness that uh, um, I was talking about before. Um, first off, like, uh, the, let me explain what, this, what the figure is. Um, each dot is a protein, um, it's connected based on the structure similarity. And the color is the darkness, so if it's, uh, if it's dark, then it's not very well annotated, and if it's bright, then it's uh, a well annotated person. And then the size is the outlier, uh, is whether it's an outlier or an inlier, according to our uh, outlier color. And so you have cases like this, where you, they're, you know, everything is an inlier, and actually, based on structure similarity, you can see that proteins are quite similar, probably you could easily figure out what this protein does based on looking at what that protein does. Um, and then in some cases like this, where um, you have, let's say, partial, in, in this case, it's almost like partial beta barrel, and if you do a structural alignment, then it, it matches really well with the beta barrel, but of course it's not complete. Um, and that's why it's a structural outlier, of course, because the combination is, is not what you see. So often in the uh, and this is actually a quite interesting example because it's turned out to be, I, I don't know if it's this one exactly, but one of the ones in here which is like this pressure beta-barrel uh, is like an antimicrobial uh, peptide that is known to interfere with gram-negative bacteria. So now we can maybe make a hypothesis that it interferes with their beta-barrels and this structure that it has could somehow be related to that. So we're trying to follow up on this as an experiment. Um, and then the last thing um, is that you can have a lot of, um, let's say, quite rare, uh, things that are quite rare in the PDB. So there are, of course, some PDB representatives in here, but then it turns out that maybe there are a lot more than what we would expect uh, forming these kinds of structures. And in general, the outlier detector also um, detects most a lot of repeat proteins, uh, and this you can see is because it's not so common, of course, to have long repeated uh, sector structure elements um, in the PDB, so you would have more globular proteins. So, this is sort of a detector of, could also be seen as a detector of whether it is a real protein or not. So, this is also something that we're trying to look into. Um, and at the same time, there are some which are. Uh, really, it just was kind of impossible to crystallize. So, for example, this one here, there is a paper about this now, is that um, some people had, had not been able to crystallize this uh, because it was hard to express and purify, and now we have this structure which seems to match what people would expect that the structure would be. Um, and then I thought this one was interesting because um, it's yeah, you can see that it looks quite weird, uh, but this is over 95 years of the on average, so all of it's high confidence. So, this is something that I just want to look into and see how is that happening. Um, and then there are cases like this where you do have a high structure peak, uh, but then there, in some regions, the topology is quite different from what you, you may expect. Um, okay, so that's sort of, let's say, uh, we're going to continue from here and sort of go into all these different avenues that I've just talked about. And so this is sort of a protein universe view of, of finding interesting um, places to look for new functions or new goals or uh, things like this. Um, so that was what I wanted to say and essentially this is where we end up. Uh, so what I meant by structured new sequence is can we use all the same algorithms and methods and ideas that we have for sequence, can we now apply that to structures? And it's not just structures, actually, because 
any anything that we can represent as a sequence of, of residues could be an analysis, could be three D coordinate, but it could also be, for instance, the language model representations that are starting to pop up now. Um, and all of these could be used in these tasks that we are aware of and, and used to doing, which is you know, uh, looking at clustering similarities, uh, using alignment, and then using the alignment to make phylogenetic trees, looking for different kinds of motifs and patterns, um, and finally for functional prediction. And I just want to take this, which uh, are some recent ideas along these directions where uh, you would expect the approach, like you, you would probably have heard the approach from a sequence perspective and now it's being used from a structure perspective. Um, or from a language model perspective in this case. Yeah, okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you.